Hi there, and welcome to Inside the Wooniverse, a podcast brought to you from the corner of Fringe and Maine. I'm your host, Colette Baron-Reed, and this is the very first episode of our limited podcast series called Spirit and Recovery. Now, if you're an avid listener of the podcast or if you've read my books, then there's a pretty good chance that you know about the addiction that I had to drugs and alcohol and that, to the grace of God, I have been living clean and sober one day at a time for over 37 years. And I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't created and leaned on a deep relationship with spirit during that recovery and still today. It's a profound experience to be here with you and a humbling one, to be honest. Here I am today, over 37 years later, one day at a time, from where I started and now today able to create this series and be here with you having this conversation. Now, joining us today and leading this interview is Connie Deletti, my executive producer. Now, if you've listened to this podcast, you know she's a familiar voice and a great one. But if not, you're in for a treat. Over to you, Connie. Oh, thank you, Colette. And I appreciate you trusting me with this role. So, thank <laughs> of course, you. I do. Thank you. <laughs> my pleasure. Okay. So, okay, let's get started. So within the 50 plus podcast uh, episodes that precede this one, you've shared some stories from your childhood and some glimpses into what it was like growing up for you and, and being in your family. So as a starting point today and in this conversation, through the lens of spirit and recovery, what was it like being a child in your home and when were you first introduced to alcohol? So, um, you know, what's really funny. I think that it wouldn't have mattered where I was or who I grew up with, because I, I think it was less about the environment and more about how I was born rather than the environment I was raising. Because I was raised in a very loving environment, very mm -hmm. loving environment. I mean, you know, my... Um, uh, my experience with alcohol came, I think, the when I was 12, mm -hmm. I had my first drink, which was called Schlievowitz. Mm, I'll never okay. forget it. My dad gave me one. It's like plum brandy, right? Yes. Like, with a, like it's 100 proof or something. Mm. Um, and, and preceding the drink, mm -hmm. and, and again, nothing to do with my parents or the environment, but I always felt too much. Always. I always felt everything. There was no boundary between me and anyone else. I knew things about people I shouldn't know mm -hmm. without prior knowledge. I had dreams about my mother's background, my father's background that I couldn't possibly know about. I mean, mm -hmm. I was a walking boundaryless being mm -hmm. and I never felt like I fit in anywhere. And I felt like I was never safe. And it had nothing to do with, I was safe with them. There was nothing in my family, my exact family to suggest I shouldn't be safe, but I never felt safe. Was that because of the ancestral patterning of my parents going through World War II, especially my mom? Mm -hmm. Don't know. But it doesn't really matter because what happened when I had my first drink mm -hmm. was all of a sudden all that went away. Literally. One drink. I'll never forget. I can, I can smell the room. I even know which room it was, was the living room. I even remember mm -hmm. it was in front of a very specific desk my mom had that had a leather inlay. Mm -hmm. I remember the moment it went through my mouth, it was a burning. I didn't particularly love the taste, but boy, oh boy, did I ever feel smart, mm -hmm. grounded, together, as much as a smart, grounded, together 12-year-old should ever feel. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> and I wasn't scared of anything. And like that was what happened. So it became it right away was medicine. It was like, oh, this is magic. This thing is magic. And so you felt something um a positive. Very. Oh yeah, very, very. And I wanted more right away. And my dad noticed that, right? It was like, and actually I've never remembered in my house. Mm -hmm. alcohol bottles, because my dad had a booze cabinet that yep. didn't have masking tape on it to tell my father how much booze was in the bottle. And I'm pretty sure they put it on there because of me. <laughs> you know, really? Or maybe my sister. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because okay. why would people do, why would anybody do that? I don't know. I've never met anybody that does that. I just thought anybody did that because I never saw anybody else's booze cabinet. Right, right. But they had, they were like making sure, you know, this is where it is today. And mm -hmm. then if it was any lower, but I, I think there was concern right from the time that I was 12. So I, I actually started having trouble with it by the time I was 15. So just three years later, 
Um, mm-hmm. I hung out with the kids in school. Mm-hmm. It was funny because my parents were very, uh, you have to be with people from good families, whatever that meant. Okay. They were very, very socially conscious to put us in a, what they thought would be safe, which mm-hmm. would be a very wasp environment. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my parents had heavy accents, European accents. And in this particular school, it was this upper crust Canadian society thing. And and I think the only reason we got in was because of my dad's title, which was Baron, which mm. meant nothing because it was really like it. And I think because they were very impressed by the fact that it sounded good. I don't mm-hmm. know, because I, I think it's a bunch of BS today, but anyhow, <laughs> we were allowed in there. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, let and we were very, very clearly let known that we were not Canadian enough ever. Mm. Like that was to my face. So I started hanging around with kids who smoked, right? I, I mean, I, I was bad. I was like a rebel. Well, I thought that was cool. So anything that looked like outside the norm or outside the law, not the law, but the law of my of children. neighborhood, the of children, children laws. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of, of, of the school, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I wanted to do that. So, it, so I was very much a rebel and, mm-hmm. uh, and alcohol fueled it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, it was funny because my I got in the worst trouble with those kids from the supposedly good families. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they were, oh, you can go to their house, sleep over. But meanwhile, they're the ones that were doing the drugs and the drinking right, and throwing up in their parents' cars. So, you know, I, I, it, the bottom line is, is I can't blame any environmental influence, although I'm sure it does you know, it certainly does bring in something, but Mm -hmm. I think I was born with this allergy to alcohol, um, and born with the predisposition to addiction. So I, 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 so I'm accountable, not, not, I can't blame myself, but it is what it is. So when you were 12 and you took your first drink and you had a response that was positive, um, at what point did the your interaction with an outside substance, whether it was drinking or like alcohol or drugs, when did it become negative? Because so far you're explaining that it gave you a sense of kind of escape. It gave you. Oh, it became negative cool. as soon as I kept yes. going. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. As soon as it became too much, right? Like uh, there was no valve of like mm. having one drink. I mean, my, okay. my, parents could make sure I didn't have more than one or two. And, but they like every night they had like Martini Rossi and their cigarettes. So there was smoking, there was drinking, there was, but it was always very controlled. But as soon as it became, I had no control right from the get go. Like if I could have drank a whole bottle, I would have. Okay. Um, and we used to with, you know, get our, get our little friends together in our parents' cars and off we would go. So it became problematic right from the beginning. I can tell you, look right from the beginning, even though it, it, I was seeking the first feeling, which was, I am now whole. Yes. It never stayed like that. But I, but I, but when I drank, I was socially no longer, um, awkward. I could have, you know, I could have these, com- I could dance, I could do all these things. Inhibitions I- were. Exactly. Okay. My inhibitions mm-hmm. definitely dissolved. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say was the journey then from being a teenager who was, uh, you know, engaging with these substances to release inhibitions and to be more, you know, socially engaged to then going into adulthood? And even though, like you said, you had a you had an awareness that this was harming you in some way or that there was like there was something there was like a couple red flags for yourself. Oh, there was more than a couple. So, um, well, let's go concurrently, like mm-hmm. concurrently. I think when you're abusing alcohol and drugs, yeah. uh, certainly on my end, um, mm-hmm. you know, I also had severe depression and anxiety. So there was like this vicious circle of, oh, if I have a drink, I won't feel like that. And I'm only a kid too at this stage. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, and I and I'm going. It's like the facade was so, you know, it looked super clean, and you never weren't allowed to talk about anything that would, you know, mm-hmm. potentially make you appear different. Which right. was was my mother's desire. Absolutely, you are not going to stick out, and you are mm-hmm. going to get straight A's. And mm-hmm. you know, but meanwhile. I was in turmoil internally in mm. turmoil. And I wonder sometimes like, you know, cause my mother was pretty convinced that we were molested by our babysitter neighbor oh, when wow. we were kids. I, I have no idea. Like I've tried, mm-hmm. I don't have a memory of that, but mm-hmm. um, certainly there was an implication. And then, you mm-hmm. know, like, I don't know, like what, where, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know, but mm-hmm. I can tell you nothing good comes out of it because then 
I don't know if it was because I, I had alcoholism that I was depressed or because I had was depressed and I had these things happen, then alcohol made me feel better. Who knows? Uh, but the bottom line is, is that then I had an eating disorder too. So uh, I had a lot of rage. I had a lot of, I mm -hmm. did not know how to manage anger at all. Yeah. And my parents, you know, this, and they were, they were upwardly mobile Europeans that were trying to fit in that really couldn't anyway, but did. And my dad did really well in academics and, mm -hmm. you know, working hard was like your number one priority and, and marrying well and having babies and all that kind of stuff, but definitely going to either law school or medical school. One or the other, you get to pick. <laughs> so, uh, a lot, there was a lot of pressure and also an, a, a, I didn't know how to manage. And of course you, the, the, the generation my parents came from, my mom was very stoic. I mean, she like just pull up your bootstraps and mm -hmm. keep moving. Yeah. I never saw her cry. So, you know, and uh, so, there, so there's a, a real sense of I, I better figure this out myself, but didn't know how. And so I became bulimic mm. when I was 14. So uh, that was like the vomiting thing. I would go into the, you know, and actually the, the first time that I remember I did that was when my geography teacher uh, told me in front of the whole class that I wasn't really Canadian because my parents were immigrants and I was the first person because they were talking about mm. um, being Canadian. Of course, they, they don't like, mention colonialism or anything, like in mm -hmm. the, in the route that, you know, mm -hmm. that it really is about, right. but it's like, we discovered Canada. Well, I know that's not true today, but, <laughs> but basically because we weren't British, you know, we didn't have any connection to that. It was a very big thing. And I remember feeling so ashamed mm. that I was not the same because everybody would look at me. And at that point, I think we had a couple of Jewish kids in the, in the, class and some some other token people that they let in because this is the 1960s anyway so I remember going into the bathroom and uh sticking my finger down my throat and throwing up like right I bought two donuts mm -hmm. <laughs> filled with cream mm -hmm. cream donuts I'll never forget I remember what they were and in I went locked myself in the stall ate them so fast and then threw them up Right to like to manage <laughs> to manage the overwhelm of emotions that were coming yeah. up. You had an external substance, and then then engaging in an, in another harmful behavior, like you said, to throw it up. So who knew which was what? So I by the time I hit recovery when I was twenty seven, mm. the events that occurred as a result of the subsequent behavior and choices that one makes that I made yeah. based on the inability to manage my feelings mm -hmm. and also the fact that I had this ability like uh, to feel the world and right. I and like bombarded by information that wasn't my own mm -hmm. no there was no structure around that I prefer not to use the word psychic because there's the the, the kind of connotations of you know that used to be way more difficult years ago not so much now people actually love that like the mm -hmm. word but for me it was like I was an intuitive and yeah. I could feel these things mm -hmm. and there was no container for anything so um but then when I went to university, again, I had a lot of trouble at school. I went to law school and uh, had an overdose, um, then ended up having to make up the year in a kind of a summer school at another university. Mm -hmm. And I was gang raped mm -hmm. there. Um, so, but, and I, when I say that, it, it's, I, I really, I get we're going to have to have some, you know, like some disclaimers here, you know, about this trauma, but um, I can see the direct relationship between drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And my and accepting a ride from people I knew I was unsafe with, mm -hmm. and that kind of you know risk taking that I would never do mm -hmm. if I was clean and sober, right? Wow. So the the choices we make, it was never to choose self harm. It was mm -hmm. to, be, for my case, it was curiosity, mm -hmm. like ooh, you know, like these guys, like these bad guys, like yeah. maybe they're cool. Like you know, I liked anybody that was an outlaw. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, bikers! Mm -hmm. Yay! Let's do that, right? And then of course after that, then you you drink more than your self-esteem is in the toilet and then you make new choices. So um, it's, I'm really adamant about not being a victim mm -hmm. because I'm very observant and I can really witness this right now. Of course, it was devastating at the time. Of course, you know, I couldn't have kids as a result of it. I had a really bad infection. And then I had another series of violent things that made sense to me because it was what I knew, but I was looking for a different end to the story. Oh, another potentially violent man. Oh, I wonder if it'll be better this time and that person won't hurt me. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I kind of went into a bit of a psychosis, if you will, around that, you know, my early 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was, had the great fortune of meeting someone uh, 
because I was in the music, I was, that was the other thing. It was, it was very acceptable to be wild because I was a singer songwriter. So that was the other piece that made, I, I found myself in environments and around people working in bars and things, you know, so that you're in, you're around it all the time. Yep. Um, and it didn't look so unusual. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I had the, I, I say it today, I have the great fortune mm. to meet someone who introduced me to the express train to hell <laughs> so I could get clean and sober early, <laughs> which was mm. cocaine. Mm-hmm. And how um, old were you? This was 27? No, no, no. I got clean and sober at 27. Okay. So yeah, what, when I was 27. So when did you get the uh, fortunate? Great, the fortune, the great fortune to do that when I was 20. And a year later, it was like, oh, wow, I feel and that would also, oh, I no longer feel bad about myself. Oh, my goodness gracious me. I feel just like God. Okay. And then, you know, so then in those moments, and then, of course, you have the crash and you have to do it again. So, so I, I don't want to bore anybody with a drunk log, but the, well, the, <laughs> hold but, on a second. This is not, <laughs> it's not boring, but I, I feel like, like if we may uh, interject one thing at this point, sure, at 20. On, on the express train, what was, if any, what what was your relationship with spirit like at this point? Okay, spirit was always in my life, so that was the other thing. Mm. I think uh, what I was, I was, I was trying to fill a God shaped hole my whole life with substances outside of myself. Mm -hmm. And I always believed in God. I just thought at that point, God was following me around with a fly swatter going, that's a mistake. (laughs) We better get that one. Um, Because I couldn't understand how these things could be happening to me. And, and so, but I never gave up on the idea that there could be some kind of redemption. Um, And I never stopped believing. I just... I just really thought I was a really bad person who then became a dirty person because of the things that happened to me, which made me then unlovable. That was kind of it. That was where I landed. Um, I'm unworthy, unlovable, not smart too, Mm -hmm. failing at everything. Um, uh, And I traded my self-worth and self-esteem for moments Mm -hmm. of of, of feeling good that never lasted. Right. So there would, maybe this time it's going to be different. It was like this insanity of, of doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Yes. And, and it's funny because I, I think about, it really makes me humble to talk about this because I am one of the lucky ones. I really am. When I think about where I came from, I mean, certainly I was raised by great parents who didn't have any like this this was not their plan and i know i it, my behavior really hurt them mm-hmm. a lot you know it was like um and i think of 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 having had to make amends about it's it's very complicated the story is very complicated mm-hmm. but what became very simple for me is when i hit bottom okay so when at what point in the timeline was bottom and what did that look like I was 26. Um, so just before that, it was the the winter. Okay. It's actually right now. I'll be honest, it's great because we're, we're pre-recording this and people should know this. We're re-recording this. Right. So it's actually exactly at this time, uh, 37 years ago, right now. We're recording December 2022. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I am really connecting to this story. Um because I'm going to be 37 clean years clean and sober January 2nd, one day at a time. And I do feel it more today that we're recording it now because I've just realized the date. Wow. This would have been around the date. Oh, I might cry. Um, uh, around the date where uh, I had that bottom and I realized I was going to die if I didn't. And I didn't know what to do. It wasn't like if I didn't do something because I yes. had tried to do so many different things and nothing worked. I promised and I made, you know, made so many promises that I broke because I had gone into a treatment center when I was 22 um, and uh, basically didn't learn anything. They even told us only out of the 35 of you, there may be eight of you that are going to survive. Wow. And I'll never forget that. Wow. I'm like, and I'm like ah! <laughs> that was very hopeful. Um, but I was just like, I just wanted to talk about the boyfriends that hurt my feelings. Okay. And- <laughs> And I didn't want to hear about the the recovery steps I had to take, but I was ready. And I think, you know, the bottom for me was a bottom where I actually saw the truth of who I was instead of the being a legend in my own mind that okay. other people around me fostered while I was sitting there passing the free base pipe. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, like, um, and, uh, it was out in front of a mirror in, uh, I, I hadn't 
basically bathed or slept, uh, you know, for about a week. And when I was standing in front of this mirror, it was a drug dealer's basement. It was early in the mornings. I would go home in the morning mm -hmm. and I would look at myself in the mirror and I finally saw myself and, and my, that my gums were bleeding because I had, um, like my skin was atrophied. It was like, there was like, it was weird. It was like almost like pock marks, but it wasn't. Um, but I had yellow, my eyes, the whites of my eyes were yellow and I have gold colored eyes. So if you can imagine, I look like Rosemary's wow, baby. Wow. <laughs> that like, cause your liver was like trying to process, oh, yeah. help you detoxify. Right. Yeah. And I saw myself for the truth. I was like, oh my God. And when, instead of help me, I'll never do it again, which was kind of the way I used to say, help me. Oh my God. Right now it was like, I'm going to die. Wow. I'm like, I give up. Like I give up. And in that moment, I had a spiritual experience that to this day, I know saved my life. And even though it wasn't perfect, because after that, I actually used a couple more times, mm -hmm. which is why my dry date um, is January 2nd, because I was still awake from New Year's Eve. Right. Right. right, that, right so right. I didn't go to bed till that. Yeah, I didn't go to bed. So, um, but I, I couldn't get high again. That was the other thing. Nothing worked. I couldn't get drunk. I couldn't get high after that spiritual awakening. And that guy's, I, I when I was like, I heard too, it's over. Wow. I thought I don't have to do this again. Wow. And then I kept trying because I didn't have another choice. Well, you, um, you knew you did what you knew, which what was I like knew and nothing worked. Wow. It was like I could drink a whole bottle and nothing would happen. And nothing. It was like the universe was like, you're totally done now. So it, you're going to figure this out. So I ended up being the first client registered in a treatment center for women in Toronto. My friend and uh, boyfriend at the time it did an intervention with me. Um, and uh, And the rest is history. And I went in there and they told me that I was going to be spending a lot of time in church basements. And I just said, no, I don't want to do that. I, so, I really no. need to be deprogrammed. Right. I've been hypnotized. Yeah. I said some crazy shit to them. <laughs> I laugh now. And they're like smiling at me. And, <laughs> and they said, like, I said, no, I'd like to be an outpatient. And they're like, no, I think inpatient <laughs> is good. Right. <laughs> You're and I was like, trying to outline okay. and control. I'm trying to right? tell them yeah. how it's going to go. Right. You know, like, oh, no, 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 no. And I have to be able to see my boyfriend. And, you know, I have things to do. I'm a singer songwriter. I'm going to be famous. And la, la, la. and they're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> and the only good thing about doing all of that is that I was always really thin. Right. I never had a weight problem at the end. <laughs> but I'd rather be a little voluptuous and be healthy than ever have that again. So, anyway, I ended up in this treatment center for women. And, uh, and, you know, and listen, this is my story. It's not the same for everybody. Yeah. You know, when we decided to do this series, we knew that the recovery, cause I had recovery from addiction and a recovery from trauma. So, um, there's different layers of recovery that I've been through that I can address. Um, but I ended up in a 12 step program and it saved my life. It saved my life. I went like a, and, and, I had this little old lady named Marguerite who was my sponsor and she was just like Aunt Clara from Bewitched. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was like a kind of dotty old lady and she, well, she wasn't actually that old, but to me, she was like, I think she was my age now, but anyway, she would wear these big moo-moos and, and, uh, and repeat herself very gently to me until I thought it was my idea. Yeah. And then I would call her up and say, guess what? And she'd be like, oh yes, dear. That's lovely. That's wonderful. That is such a great insight. Meanwhile, she been saying it right saying it, saying it. Yes. So, like basically i followed her around like a little duck yeah and uh and i remember all the counselors at the treatment center mm -hmm. um came to my one that we had a one-year celebration oh, amazing and a couple of them cried mm -hmm. and another one said to me you know you were the one we voted less least likely to succeed oh. because wow. i was so mentally Unstable. One of the doctors said I had schizophrenic. I had a schizophrenic psychosis mm. because I could hear voices. Mm. I was like trying to explain it. Like, well, okay, listen, you know, so these yeah. voices. Well, now of course I'm a medium, right? So it's like they're dead people, <laughs> right? Right. But you need a metaphysician. Like, okay. metaphysician actually on the I'm a, a well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to explain my experiences, and they're like writing it down. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, anxiety disease, yes. manic depression, hypomania, right. Right. all these like lists of of things that. I was the diagnoses, right? Which was really not that, mm -hmm. but that's fine. Like I, I have to say, you know, the very fact that I've come from that and here I am today, but the best part mm -hmm. 
the best part was that I had structure mm. and the structure was about shadow work. And what I, and the layers of what I was capable of going through, which is why I love the fact that those 12 steps, and again, keep an open mind. Some of you guys are going to listen to this show and go, I never do that. And you don't have to just try to identify if you have a problem and you're listening to this show today, uh, just see if you can identify with my feelings. And all I'm going to tell you is how it worked, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, how, how did I become who I am today? Um, and it's because the structure enabled me to have a conscious contact to my higher power on a daily, and I could live one day at a time because anybody could handle a day. Well, this is the thing, literally to my next question. <laughs> what does it mean to be living a clean and sober lifestyle? And how did the 12 steps support you in that? It's really important that there is a very specific thing about 12 step programs because mm. I am not uh, is is anonymity, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. I am not speaking for a program. I am not speaking, I'm not even acknowledging that I am in a program, right? So, but at the time, I will talk about the, the structure fact that, that helped you. The structure that helped me mm -hmm. was about um, a core value of accountability, mm -hmm. uh, a core value of trust, a, a, a core value of forgiveness. A core value of action, right? That that you aren't, and and a way in which to redefine mm -hmm. what happened mm -hmm. and what I could and what purpose that could serve. So much like I have a card in my uh, spirit animal oracle. Mm -hmm. I remember my dad when he taught me how to read Turkish coffee cups. He said to me, you know, like the vulture always nothing is ever wasted because the vulture can take in the carcass, mm -hmm. something that is diseased mm -hmm. and unusable and turn it into something usable like fertilizer. Like it takes away all the bacteria mm -hmm. and anything negative, but when it digests it, right? right? So it became, I could take the worst thing that happened to me in my life mm -hmm. and by sharing it with others, mm -hmm. I could help them. And by, by, by outlining what I did um, to to take the steps to move away from that place, mm -hmm. right? And it was an evolution. It wasn't an overnight thing, um, you know, and it was like for for the past 37 years, it's still peeling onions. You say one day at a time, like the skin is one skin at a time, one day at a time. And to your point that you just mentioned that we know people can be a, you know, and I'll just use it in air quotes because I know some people say misuse, some people say addicted, but there can be substances, there can be can be behaviors like shopping, like eating, like sex addiction, right? Um, gaming, the internet itself, yes. right? Just want scrolling, social media, sports. I mean, whatever. Um, but the what do you wish more people knew? about addiction and about spirit as a partner in recovering from that? Well, addiction is not moral. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's not an immorality and it doesn't mean that you're less of a person. Like that's the, that's, that's really important. I like the disease model. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I like the disease model in that um, you or in the allergy model, like you're allergic to the substance that you don't have the capacity to, um, to metabolize it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's an escape. It's an escape so that it is, it's a symptom of something much deeper. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that it is possible to live free of the burdens of the memory of the, if certainly if you have a conscience, mm -hmm. um, you have to clean up the, you, you have to clean up your past. Mm -hmm. You absolutely have to, you have to face it mm -hmm. and you have to release yourself from it. And when it is possible, you have to make direct amends to people. And sometimes it's not possible because it's, they say, it, you know, except to, when to do so would injure them or others, mm -hmm. right? Or yourself, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you can clean your life up mm -hmm. and you can live uh, sober, meaning sober and so clean and sober doesn't mean without like dry, because mm -hmm. you can be a dry drunk, mm -hmm. right? Sobriety is the willingness to do whatever it takes to be to keep that wholeness, to, to do the shadow work that is necessary so that you don't cause harm. Mm -hmm. Certainly a lot of, we do unconsciously, we don't mean to, whatever. And to become um, productive members of society. 
which wherever that looks like, mm-hmm. you can be that. That's so fascinating. So like clean and sober as a concept of like sobriety being consciousness, like being aware yes. and, cl- and clean and cleanliness being like good. Like yeah. doing, if we can make simplify it like that, but it, that's very fascinating and interesting. Yeah. Good orderly direction, mm. right? That's God. And, and, uh, and I think right. to the idea, I mean, yeah, it's like the God consciousness, um, and also to know that it's it's progress, not perfection. That was also something. I gained a lot from my experiences in those church basements. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I was ready, um, I I mean, I, I literally believe that I owe my entire life to 12-step programs. Mm-hmm. I really do. Like mm-hmm. and, and therapy. Mm-hmm. So because I had all the different traumas that were, it's not appropriate to... I, you know, like there's only so much I can get to yeah. um, from one program. And mm-hmm. so then I went to other ones, mm-hmm. right, that were specific to those things. Mm-hmm. Um, spe- for me, the things like EMDR, mm-hmm. the tapping, you know, tapping is great, but I don't avoid anything. And I've made mistakes even in recovery, even in the, the person that I am today. Um, you know, I'll see some unconscious behaviors come up again and realize, wow. I thought I had cleaned that up, right? And then, because we're just people, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. so I think that's the other thing. I, I I think it's really important to recognize that we are human, mm. you know, and that when you, a clean and sober life is the reclamation of your humanity mm. with all the, the full catastrophe of it and willingness to be present to all aspects of your life and willing to clean it up um, and not to clean up, clean up things that are not yours because that's also part of it, the deep sense of, codependency and people pleasing and behaviors that the, that we become very maladapted. Um, things that worked for us to survive early on, once you get clean and sober, you realize, oh, I can't behave like that anymore. Um, and then, you know, then you have to deal with it as it comes up as you are able, because nothing is solved overnight. And that, I think you maybe even started touching upon that relationship between addiction and shadow work. Yeah. There is a seduction, a seductive quality Mm. to uh, the internet right now, for example. And I can tell you that our our culture Mm. is a is a culture of addiction. Mm. You know, we become uh, obsessed with the way people look on Instagram or the way you know, like, oh, my life doesn't look like that, like my real life. So. I, there must be something wrong with me. I see a lot of young people going through that right now, um, you know, seeing what it looks like and it's not the same. And, and Psychologically, but also, and biologically, I mean, the inter, well, we could say like there's a lot of things on the intro. It's a trigger enriched environment because we're set up with scrolling, dopamine hits, you know, it's yes. like the neurotransmission. On one hand, you, yes. yes. Biological you get blood. rewards too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh my God, look at all the likes. Yeah. Look at all that. It's, 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 I'm very conscious and very boundary around social media. Mm. It's a time sucker. Look look at where we go out. Everybody's got their faces looking at their 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 devices. Like but, yeah. nobody looks at mm. each other. You know, even my husband and I sometimes and we're pretty good at leaving our phones at home when we go to dinner and whatever if we don't, there we are like, you know, and then we're pretty you know, it's it's I'm I'm very conscious of it. Um yeah. but it's not just that. Mm. It's like we are looking for ways in which to feel good. Mm-hmm. Um, as we receive information of stories that makes us feel powerless, like mm-hmm. the climate change, like, uh, war. you know, yeah. social justice, Famine. war, yes, all of, of these course. things that mm-hmm. feel too big for the individual to handle, mm-hmm. then, oh, where's my escape? Oh, I feel good doing that. Because mm-hmm. you do, you feel good. Mm-hmm. You know, like I don't gamble mm-hmm. just because I, I can just really get right in there. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'll take $20 to a slot machine if I go to Las Vegas. I work too hard for my money. But I'm not, because I know that, ooh, that feeling of winning, right? It's like... Awareness, though, I mean, that you're talking yeah. about is that anybody can be aware of their behaviors. And everyone, like the human condition, we all have opportunities to engage or indulge in something. And when we are, especially when we're feeling a certain way, like like you identified, powerless, uh, we get this infusion of news, we get this infusion of events and things we, beyond our control. It is in a way natural to want to 
um, soothe ourselves in some way. Yeah, it's a self-soothing mm-hmm. thing. You, me and ice cream, you should see me. <laughs> I mean, I like Mark. He'll uh, like he'll know like when I'm I'm past uh, the halfway point on a dessert. He'd be like, should you? keep going with that because he's because i'd be like hey, oh is this yummy thing or a tasting thing because it it's not be, yeah right? it goes into a different zone for me and i'm very conscious of that like food is my thing yeah. i have to be care- like i cannot have a very specific type of chocolate chip cookie that has coconut and pecans in it, it goes <laughs> i cannot have a bag zone. near me yeah. i will eat the whole thing right. i can't i just won't i uh, mm-hmm. so i've become really aware i mean that's that's the worst thing that happens to me now i eat too many chocolate chip cookies. Not, it's not a big deal. But I'm also aware of being out of the moment, being mm-hmm. in the soothing, looking for something outside of mm-hmm. myself when mm-hmm. when really being present, not trying to escape what's really going on, not, t- not trying to escape reality and having a reasonable relationship with soothing things, which yeah. are good. Like it's good to be soothing also, but it's not good f- for, for us to be doing that all the time when we end up making it harmful. harmful. If there's a there's a level yeah. right? there's a there's a there's a line to cross there's a difference a line uh a distinguishing and being aware of that is that clean clean and sober so what then how would you define recovery and this might be a funny question but are, are is a person would you say we're always in a state of recovery are you ever recovered or like yeah, it's a weird it's a weird conversation because I believe I'm a recovered okay. alcoholic and drug addict okay. because I haven't had it, you know, and because one would like to believe that we are past that, but I'm also not safe to pick up a drink. Okay. I, I one okay. day I don't even play with that. Okay. Because somebody said to me, "Why do you call yourself an alcoholic?" Because because I I because I know where I went and I've seen it. It is there has been evidence in front of me when when a mm-hmm. person goes back out and picks up a drink, they very quickly oh. go to the place they left off and oh, wow. mostly okay. die or land in an institution or kill themselves, right? So I can't play with certain things and I never will be able to, and I'm okay with that. But I only do that one day at a time. I don't say for the rest of my life, I won't do blah or blah. But spirit, Mm -hmm. you would ask me a question earlier and I didn't quite finish it. (laughs) Yes, Spirit and recovery is, I am always in conscious contact to a higher power Mm -hmm. and I don't do this alone. Mm. I am clean and sober by the grace of God. And my life is as a, my, I got a second chance at life that I didn't deserve. I didn't win a prize because I was a good person or whatever, but I became, Mm -hmm. and you know, I, I had to become someone new and I'm continuing to become someone new in order to serve. And because I got that second chance, I don't take my life for granted one iota. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is in service to the divine. It is my thanks back. Mm. You know, the way I live today and it's not perfect. I make mistakes. I've made poor judgments. Uh, you know, I, I, I that's just human. Mm-hmm. But where I can and where it is appropriate, I will clean it up. Uh, but yeah, God is number one. My primary relationship is to my higher power, period. Because we're in the universe. <laughs> that's I got to ask a couple more questions here, but <laughs> yes. uh, I'm going to turn it to a couple more magical um, sure. aspects of your recovery because you have talked about this. So I wanted to kind of like start pulling a couple threads out. So sure. divination. Oh, that became a big piece. Let's talk about where did divination uh, start entering into your recovery and how did spirit and divination then continue the journey with you? So here's the coolest thing. Mm -hmm. So I had obviously had my own tarot deck. I I had my first tarot deck when I was 17, but then somebody gifted me a tarot deck in my 20s. Um, But I was seeing it as the typical mystical, esoteric, Mm -hmm. uh, exotic, (laughs) you know, fortune telling device, right? Okay. Um, It wasn't what it is for me today Mm -hmm. until Mm -hmm. I was, I was in my first or second year of sobriety. Um... And I went to a therapist. She was a Jungian analyst, which is why I became fascinated with Jung. Mm-hmm. But she was a psychotherapist who used Jung. And she used a tarot deck called the Handel Tarot, H-A-N-D-L, Tarot, as part of our therapy. Okay. And I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> what are those? Right? Like, what are you telling wait, my fortune? I'm here what for you, therapy. 
no, no, she didn't ever <laughs> no, talk I'm about that. And I didn't, my, yes. and I'd never seen, and I'd never seen that deck. So okay. I didn't equate it right. to tarot right. until I looked at it. Mm. I went, wait, that's a tarot deck. Mm. You called it, you know, she says, so we're going to pull a, we're going to, you know, we're going to do something unique and different. We're going to pull a card and we're going to talk about what comes up. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, good, pull a card. Oh, I know about cards in my head, yeah. but it's like not, I didn't see tarot deck until I looked at the box. Wow. I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> that's like a tarot, like <laughs> stuff I know. Yeah. You can do it for this, mm. you know? And then I was like, I jumped right in nope. there because- Dang. All of a sudden, the thing that I was most drawn to, which was which were the mystical arts, mm -hmm. it was something I was obsessed over yeah. since I was really young, and anything to do with divination. Only now, this was me mm -hmm. learning how to stay con in a conscious contact with my higher power using the same card deck. Wow, got that very profound, like witchy. Wow. Word, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, wait a second, I could do that too. <laughs> is that what this is for? So consequently, mm -hmm. I used it as a journaling tool, mm. right? I, st I started journaling with them and, uh, and then I, then of course I became a reader. So I, I started reading, I'm, we're not going to really talk about that because I actually avoided it for the first two years. I didn't want anything to do with doing it so much as that. And then I was able to see a more therapeutic perception of what the cards were telling me or a more psychological mm -hmm. thing yeah. as opposed to event driven. Like this is going to happen or that happened. It was more like, oh, this, this quality insight is yeah. what's exactly wow. is what I'm seeing here. Mm. Um, and this is the psychology behind it. Does it make sense to you? And they're like, oh yeah, it's totally how I think and how I've been thinking. This is what's been, yeah, oh, that describes my husband. It's like, it became very deep mm -hmm. and very wide. Mm -hmm. So, but it became a spiritual tool. So that is why I think really mm -hmm. it's because I use divination and recovery to track myself because I also didn't trust myself. Mm. I trusted God. Yeah. Didn't trust me <laughs> at all. Right. Because I also mm. right away didn't, I mean, I was clean and sober off drugs and alcohol, but then I picked up food again. Mm. Right. So, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I wasn't, I was still active in an addiction, mm -hmm. which was food, but it was better than the other things. So then that mm -hmm. took a while and then I gave up cigarettes. So it was like layers, but that, the, so of course I still always felt that sense of, I'm not a hundred percent sure I can trust myself. Mm -hmm. So this will help me. And it did. And I was like, Ooh, not only can I trust spirit, mm -hmm. but I can, I have tools. I have a, Oh, Oh, right. This thing today, mm -hmm. I have to watch out for this thing today. And I was Gung ho. I mean, I went to five meetings a week. Wow. I was very active. I was, you know, I started a program with two other guys early on many years ago. And I was, I was one of the founders of the program. I'm not going to bother talking about it, but you know, I was, I was really committed to everything. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, um, and, uh, it was a life changing moment where the woo woo mm -hmm. that I laugh, you know, that's why we call this inside the universe. Mm -hmm. It's my, it's a joyful name yes, yeah. for this. That's why we, for the mystical qualities, I don't, it's, you know, there's joy in it, but that was integrated into my recovery mm -hmm. right from the get-go. Wow. That's right from the so get-go. So incredible. Yeah. And to think of you at that time and, and how you've evolved your relationship and your, like just your relationship and with cards, with with then going into oracle decks, and it's such a rich now. Even well, I always thought your cards were so rich, but now even such a deeper, more meaningful um, point of birth for you and oracle decks and cards. It's because of my recovery, <sighs> yeah. So that's and I use recovery language mm. also because yeah, you said something about. Um, about, um, are we always in recovery? Are we all, you know, earlier and I, again, I kind of, I've been going around the circles yeah. to answering your questions, yeah. but you know, um, I believe that we're not broken, mm -hmm. that we're never broken. It's that we perceive ourselves mm -hmm. as broken, mm -hmm. that all the pieces are there and they can always evolve. Mm -hmm. But emergence I've, I've, so I don't believe we're broken, but I believe that we emerge mm. out of a state of being into the next state of being. Mm -hmm. And so things have to fall away. Mm. One of my favorite, favorite, uh, you know, spiritual teachers is Dr. Bio Akimalafe, who is a Nigerian um, teacher and, and, you know, healer and philosopher and amazing person. He always say, never not broken. Mm. But 
it is the Western viewpoint of what is broken, therefore it's unusable. Like you throw it away, that mm -hmm. kind of brokenness, which is what I identified with before I got clean and sober, mm -hmm. that I was a throwaway, right? That is a different version. So this is, you are always emerging. So you're never the same. I think that's mm -hmm. what that means. Never not broken is like, you are never going to be the same person. You are always going to evolve and move and, and if you are conscious and aware of that, mm -hmm. then you can celebrate that and not be afraid mm -hmm. of the shadow and not be afraid of, of you know, what mm -hmm. has occurred and, and the deep trauma mm -hmm. um, that you have as an individual, which I had individually, which was, by the way, exactly what happened to my mother at the same age, which was also very interesting, wow. which I didn't know about until after and I was in the hospital. And then my mother told me that wow. it happened to her with Russian soldiers when she was 19. Wow. So, and then she goes, don't tell anybody after that. So meanwhile, she's, <laughs> I'm sure now she's in spirit. She doesn't mind, mm -hmm. but oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh yeah. Never talk about the family and never tell anybody that you were ever vulnerable mm -hmm. or violated ever, ever. Right. So that yeah. was the other thing I wasn't allowed to talk about it. So, um, but anyhow, but the idea is this, that we are not broken as in throwaway beings. Mm -hmm. You know, we may be wounded. Mm -hmm. We may come to recognize that in order to become the person we want to become, we need to change, which means we had to face things that we're afraid of, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't mean that the broken quality means we're throwaway. Broken in, in what I believe what he says and really hit me was that, you know, when a, when a, a tulip, for example, uh, pushes itself out of the leaves, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if they break open in order mm -hmm. for this flower to ra rise up. And then, you know, and so that's what we're always in the constant evolution mm -hmm. of breaking open and not being broken, but breaking open. Like There's a, a difference. with an egg. Exactly. Cracking, cracking into the next. And the then ne they crack <laughs> one and then they, exactly. And then another egg comes and yeah, it cracks open. Yeah. And so that was the other thing that had to change for me is to, and it gave me a great sense of empathy and compassion for people, mm. you know, to realize that, yeah, like society has, you know, conditioned us. The, I, I, I like the Vishen Lakhiani says mm -hmm. the culture scape. I like that, you know, the culture scape, yeah. um, you know, that the culture scape, we, we get conditioned by the culture scape and to see ourselves a certain way. Mm -hmm. If you don't conform to certain behaviors and norms, et cetera, then you're, you're broken somehow, or you're, or if you have been abused or if you've, something has happened, then you're like, no, this is part of who we are. Mm -hmm. I do not regret anything. Mm. Not one thing. When people say, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I went, no, don't be sorry. Mm -hmm. Don't be sorry that happened to me. Mm -hmm. You know, as a result of these things that happened to me, and yes, yes, I can totally claim that I was victimized. 1000%. I was victimized, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that I am a victim. So it's that right? it happened for you, for your highest good or the highest good of all. Well, at the time, it sure it didn't well, feel like that. I'm just saying now that <laughs> you're saying, yes. Yeah. Well, now I looked, I made it into that. I made it mean something else. And that, that is my source of strength. Mm -hmm. Because what, what I made it mean when I was younger was that I was a victim. I was broken. I was dirty. I was useless. I was meant to be thrown away. Mm -hmm. um, as I got clean and sober and I could see myself uh, that God didn't make junk mm -hmm. and that even the people that did that to me, you know, weren't junk either. They were just really hurt people, hurt people. Mm -hmm right? Mm -hmm. Screwed up people that, uh, that, you know, and have people control other people. Look at what happens in war, mm -hmm. you know, um, they use sex to control the population against the females in the population because right. it degrades them mm -hmm. and, and, and emasculates the men. It's like, it's a thing, yeah. right? And so many women in my, in my membership site at the Oracle Circle membership, we had one woman talked very openly about something. And then I, I shared my story. And then I said, like, how many of you in here it was hundreds of people in there have had an experience like this. And 90% of the people said me, 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 mm -hmm. me, I have. So it's like, you know, I think it's really important for us to heal mm -hmm. and change our behavior so that we do as little harm as we possibly can, mm -hmm. like continue to become awake mm -hmm. to what we do and what we say and what we are not knowing, you know, I know personally, I'm going to be working on myself until I die yeah. and not working on myself. Like I'm flawed, but like evolving, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. evolving myself, mm -hmm. um, and learning and learning how to be better connected with greater respect mm -hmm. for others. 
um, and we be, we before me to the best of my ability and and be that emissary. And I think each one of us has a unique path. Each one of us has a purpose built right into us. Mm-hmm. And that being clean and sober is allowing that purpose to be basically me, letting me be the steward of that purpose. And you, and I always say I, on my prayers, use me, mm-hmm. use me for your highest good. And sometimes I have to see things and, and experience things that are painful in order for me to change them. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, that pattern right there. See that thing you've been doing for years? <laughs> you see what that does? Mm-hmm. That's no good. Mm-hmm. Right. And, mm-hmm. and like, how are you going to change that? Mm-hmm. And again, I don't do anything by myself. Mm-hmm. I, I do it with God. I do it with honesty to the best of my ability. I do it with a therapist mm-hmm. and I'll go through phases where I don't do therapy and other times I do. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm, st- I still use what I learned mm-hmm. in, in pro- the programs that I have uh, attended in the past. Mm-hmm. And, and I know where I can get help when I need it. And I don't, I don't have, I, I'm, I have enough humility to know that I can't do it alone. Mm. Like that is something I know I'm not because be left to my own devices, right. I'm behind enemy lines. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm like totally behind enemy lines in there. I will convince myself, no, no, I don't need to do that. Mm-hmm. So, but I'll be like, nope, <laughs> bring it to bring it to someone you trust, mm. talk it out, work mm-hmm. it out, and say, okay, what do I need to do, mm-hmm. if anything, um, to clear this and to step into uh, step into a life I'm proud of, and I can say I am. Mm-hmm. I can, I really can say that today. What's your deepest hope from this series that our listeners walk away with? Well, my deepest, the reason we did it Mm. was because, you know, when you and I talked, uh, you know, um, everybody's always asked me, tell your story and how did, you know, like, how did you come from this? And, Mm -hmm. um, and we, we wanted to, to use this series as a way to uh, acknowledge how much pain there is for so many people and that there is hope. Mm-hmm. This is this is about hope. My hope is that people find hope. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. That's my biggest hope. Mm-hmm. My di- my my intention mm-hmm. to do this is to show people they're not alone. Mm-hmm. That trauma, addiction it comes in all shapes and sizes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're not you're right when and we do think that we're the only ones that feel that shame, mm-hmm. that feel that isolation, that feel that sense of uselessness mm-hmm. and, and rage and repression and all that stuff. Like we think it's only us, but it's not. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and there is help. There is absolutely help for mental health is something where there is help to be had. You just have to want it. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to just reach out. There's that one section, that one step towards the gods and they'll take 10 steps towards you and nobody has to suffer alone. Mm-hmm. Nobody. Let's pull a card together to see if there's anything okay. else the universe wants us <laughs> to talk about. This has been really such a beautiful, inspiring, and uh, raw and vulnerable conversation. So thank you so much. Ah, uh, yeah. And I, I didn't, you know, it's funny. I, you know me, I'm pretty effusive, et cetera. And I did feel pretty humbled by the conversation today <laughs> because, you know, it's like, yeah, I revisit. I never want to forget where I came from mm. ever. You know, like people see me today. Oh, look at successful Colette. She has all these things. She teaches all over the world. She does all these things. All of those things are true. Mm -hmm. I am that person. But I grew out of this. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of... A lot of manure in my garden. <laughs> on your little acorn to grow into <laughs> my little tree. My acorn. Yes. Right, exactly. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, there was a lot that went into that. I, I paid a high price to sit in this yeah. chair. Well, we're and, grateful uh, for And I'm always sharing. aware of it. Always aware of it too. So no question. I know where I came from. Okay. Amazing here we role go. model. I just want to say that. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Let's see what spirit has okay. in store for us what to chat. What does spirit say? Let's see. What else? What else? Did we miss anything? Oh, covenant, sacred contract. Oh, that's a beautiful one. So I'm going to look up the uh, the deck here. Commitment for the greater good. Hmm. Um, it's important that you understand what you're signing up for. Be sure to read the fine print so as not to commit to something you'll soon regret. Right? So, <laughs> so like, get ready. Um, don't hesitate to put all your own cards on the table so that your motives and desires are transparent and nothing is left in darkness. Mm. When shadow elements remain hidden, the covenant breaks down and becomes a contract with an unspoken dark side that is inevitably fulfilled. Like the bottom line is, is that, you know, it says you've been invited now by the universe to enter into a sacred contract. So the sacred contract 
in recovery mm-hmm. is I am willing to go to any lengths, mm-hmm. any lengths, um, no shortcuts. If there are shortcuts, the shadow will take over, right? That's the contract. That's the covenant mm-hmm. that it's got to be clean, that I, that my conscious contact to a higher power and my primary relationship is with spirit and everything comes second, mm-hmm. right? If I, if I let the ego run, that's what's going to happen. So that, that's, that's what I'm signing up for, right? Is mm-hmm. the consciousness of that. And you can't, you can't be in denial. Like it's you, you, it ruins it for yourself. If you decide to make a commitment to change, mm-hmm. uh Oh, right. <laughs> you better be, be willing to see what, what can happen. And also it's like, if you're listening to this right now and you were looking for a sign <laughs> about moving forward and transforming yourself and going into any, you know, you need to go into the shadow to take a look, to see what is there for you to be able to fulfill that sacred contract or the highest purpose you can contribute to this whole world, your life, your sacred contracts that you sign up for before you even got here. Yep. This is it. This is your sign. <laughs> There's a lot yeah. of tools that you shared. And um, I mean. And it takes yeah, courage. It takes courage. Yeah. But I think here's the other thing about the sacred contract card, which isn't in the card, but I always think of the sacred contract is that we all have a sacred contract when we come onto this planet. Mm-hmm. We're here as emissaries of the divine. The divine lives inside us. We're not, it's not outside separate to us. And I think that's been a problem with many organized religions. I'm not against organized religion at all. I actually wanted to be an interfaith minister. Mm-hmm. I think there's beauty in all of them. But there's this idea of spirit is outside of us and somehow we're human beings, you know, pleading for something out of us. But it lives in us, mm-hmm. you know, and that contract is that if we deny that 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 divinity within us and only listen to our ego selves, we are going to have consequences Mm -hmm. that are going to be painful. Um, And it goes both ways too, you know, like people can project and it's not right. They they can project onto you too. And we see a lot of that now, especially with the polarization that are going on in the world. So our contract is to be the the best us, Mm -hmm. not the best meaning like whose best is that, but it's more about, right? (laughs) Well, doing your best, but also fulfillment. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's fulfilling the experience of being fully human, you know, bringing your humanity to the table and bringing love. That is, we have a capacity to really help and heal one another through that one thing, Mm -hmm. the acts of compassion, love, and also self-care, self-preservation, like in a way too, like not to try to do other people's work for them. If somebody doesn't, like you can't rob people of their bottom mm-hmm. either, right? Like people have to come to that, to that, to themselves. Like I will never tell anybody you need to be in recovery. Mm. You know, when we call, use those terms in recovery, it means, you know, addiction recovery or whatever. It That has to be somebody else's choice, but I can share my journey. Mm. Cause I kicked, I didn't want to go for a year. Now I'm not going there. No way. That was the last, last house on the road for me was when I had to surrender because nothing else worked and it finally did. And that's the gift. So our contract, if you're not an addict, if you're not an alcoholic, if you, if you don't identify with addiction at all, but you are suffering in some way right now, cause you're not radically accepting the world as it is around you, you can't really make any changes because you're not seeing with clarity. You know, so it's realizing that we're, we have to be in this together. So just one small act of kindness can, can change somebody's life and let them feel that they're not alone. And you don't even know what you're, when you're impacting somebody, you don't know. Thank you so much, Colette. This was incredible. I am extremely grateful and humbled to be here. Thank you.